You just tell me when you're ready and I can... Yeah, I can. yeah sure. Okay. Well, I would like to say good morning to all my fellow Croatian medical students and I would like to say good evening to Dr. Andre Mansour. Uh, it's great to have you all here today. Uh, like we already talked about, we managed to schedule this lecture after quite a talk, changing between platforms and time zones and everything, but uh, we, we managed in the end. And for this, I would like to give uh, the word to Dr. Andre Mansour. Uh, good evening. Thank you so much, Nicola, and I really appreciate the invitation. Uh, we've interacted a few times, uh, you know, online, whether it's on the PDX PDX website or Twitter, and it's been uh, it's been great, um, you know, getting to know you and, and talking medicine with you. And so this is this is going to be fun, I think, for you guys. Um, this talk is called Physical Diagnosis Potpourri, and um, you'll see that. There's a detective on this on the you know the the intro slide, and the reason why I have a picture of a detective is because I, I always make the analogy that internal medicine doctors are a lot like detectives, you know, where we have to comb the scene of a crime and we have to gather clues from that crime scene and put those clues together to solve the case, or, or in our case, it's to make a diagnosis, you know, and. Um, I define, this is all ties in with diagnostic reasoning. I define diagnostic reasoning as the skillful acquisition and use of clues from a patient's history exam and other data to make a diagnosis. And it's really a, a strong emphasis on acquisition. It's not just the use of clues. It's the acquisition and use of clues. And um, physical exam is a rich source of clues uh, that a lot of people, you know, sort of, take for granted these days and um you know it, much to the detriment of patients um you know because there are often physical findings that are missed on patients and patients that the diagnosis is then delayed by weeks in some cases months and you know so uh you'll see 15 cases in this talk where physical examination there was an important clue or several important clues that really helped to clinch the diagnosis and in some cases, these patients were diagnosed only after a very long and circuitous diagnostic adventure. And again, that comes at a cost to patients, both literally because testing costs money. And, and you know, these days people are just ordering tests and CAT scans and MRIs and cardiac MRIs and all these different, you know, sophisticated, costly tests, rather than relying on the history and the physical exam, which I, again, are very rich sources of information. And it's both, so it's both a literal cost to patients and a figurative cost to patients because, again, they go a long time without a diagnosis and they are suffering during that time. So uh, really to, to do the best for patients, we want to get back to the bedside and we want to be able to acquire these clues. And again, we're like detectives. You could have the same crime scene with the same information in it. Ten different detectives could evaluate that crime scene. And some of them are going to glean important clues and pieces of information that others gloss over or miss altogether. And the same is true in medicine. Again, it's our job to be at the bedside and to acquire those clues that we use to make a diagnosis. And so uh, we're going to get to these cases that I hope hopefully will sort of show you all and impress upon you how important it is to be able to, to take a good history. And this talk is all about physical examination. So we're going to be pretty limited with the history that I give you in the cases, but it's going to be all about physical examination and how it, those clues help to make a diagnosis. And before we start, I'll just say that all the patients, um, you know, I want to thank all the patients who are represented in this in this presentation. They, you know, gave their consent to have these images shared for, for educational purposes. So, you know, this presentation wouldn't be possible without them. So let's get to case number one. And, um, I can't see the chat box, but this is a very interactive talk. So I want you guys to use the chat box or unmute yourselves if you'd like. Nicola can also serve as the spokesperson. So if somebody, you know, if you type in an answer in the chat box, Nicola will say it out loud so I can so I can uh, see it. I'm seeing a bad network quality warning. Are, um, is am I still coming through? OK, Nicola? Yeah, everything's fine okay. here. Okay. So, yeah. OK, great. So um, this first case um, is a 46 year old woman with fatigue. Again, we're going to be very light on the history part. This is all about examination and I'm not trying to fool you all. So what what findings there are two images of this patient, one of her face and kind of neck and chest and one of her hands. 
what findings are present here in, the, in these images? And again, please use the chat box or unmute yourselves if you'd like. Yeah, we have one student uh, saying jaundice. Absolutely. So there are three, the three primary colors are red, blue, yellow. And a patient's skin color, and in this case, not only her skin tone, but her, her uh, sclera, are tending towards one of those three colors. And in this case, it's yellow. And that can tell us very important information about the patient. If a patient's skin is closer toward blue, they're cyanotic, and that tells us about hypoxemia and a possibility of a right to left shot. In this case, she's jaundiced or, or tending towards yellow, and that's a very important clue. What are, what are the other findings here? Could that be the palmar erythema? On the yes. Right? Absolutely. This is what's known as palmar erythema. It's a bit of a misnomer because what you'll notice is that the, actually the palm is spared, but the thenar and hypothenar eminences and the pads of the fingers are red or, or, or uh, erythematous. And that's, that's a, an important finding. And again, it, it spares the palm. So even though it's called palmar erythema, it really refers to erythema around the outside and the pads of the fingers. And what else do you notice in this photo here, in the left photo, in the chest and neck area? Do you notice those red lesions? So we close, we do a close up on one of those lesions, and this is from a different patient uh, with the same finding. So here it is, and I'm going to show the video. These are known as, anybody know what these are called? They fill from the inside out when you compress them, and that's a very unique feature. We have a spider angioma in the chest. Yes. Exactly, and that's a form of telangiectasia. It's a specific form known as a spider angioma, and it gets that name because it looks like a spider. It has a central kind of body of the spider, that central arteriole, and then those little branches are coming out. Those little capillaries look like spider legs, and this is known as a spider angioma. And when you go to examine her abdomen, you notice that she's distended. And anytime you see distension in the abdomen, the first question you want to ask yourself, is that distension symmetric or is it asymmetric? If it's asymmetric, it, it suggests maybe organomegaly, like a liver or a spleen, or maybe a tumor or something like that. If it's symmetric distension, that could be uh, fluid in the belly. And one way you can decide and, and confirm the presence of fluid is to percuss the abdomen. And you we do something known as shifting dullness. And so this is what that video demonstrates here. So, to panic, to panic, panic, dull. Let's have you roll this way. So I'll play it one more time. So pay attention. Notice that the, the note is tympanitic over the gas. And when I go to the lateral side of the abdomen, it becomes dull. And I, I don't move my finger, but I have the patient roll. And now because fluid goes to the dependent area, that, that spot where I was tapping that was dull now becomes tympanitic again because now it's higher up and it's above the fluid level. So I'll play it one more time. this way to panic again so we've got a, a woman coming in with fatigue and she has jaundice spider angiomas palmar erythema and ascites as you all identified what's the underlying diagnosis here and again i'm not trying to fool you so if it sounds seems obvious to you uh, i think you have the right answer We have a chronic liver failure. Yeah, cirrhosis. Yeah, exactly. And, um, you know, I like to start with this case because cirrhosis is so common. And, you know, in this case, the, the, the findings were obviously helpful, but 
I found that the absence of these findings should make us question the diagnosis. A lot of times patients come to me with a diagnosis of cirrhosis and they don't have spider angiomas, they don't have palmar erythema. And in those cases, I question whether they truly had cirrhosis or not. And there are some mimics of cirrhosis, like things like constrictive pericarditis that could look like cirrhosis. And it, in fact, they don't have cirrhosis and it's, an, it's a different diagnosis. So I think this is an important case to start with. Let's move to case number two is a young man coming in with fever and chills. And I like the hands. There's a lot of rich information that we can learn from the hands. So here's another case involving the hands. And uh, what do we notice here? There are these tender nodule, nodular lesions, kind of in a similar distribution as palmar erythema on the thenar, hypothenar, and pads of the fingers. Um, and while we're thinking about that, we look at his feet and we see these lesions. These are flat, um, non-tender lesions, okay? And we should be thinking about, we, we should be formulating a hypothesis now a young man coming in with fever and chills. And one thing I didn't tell you is he's using intravenous drugs, and that's another clue. And we have these findings on exam that should make us think about something. And anticipation is so critical in medicine. When you, when you anticipate something, it makes you much more likely to see it, hear it, feel it, than if, you know, because there's a, there, you know, this famous expression, the eyes can't see what the mind doesn't know, okay? So if you aren't anticipating something, you might miss it. By the way, the feet, you know, a lot of people wouldn't look at the feet, but we had a hypothesis based on the hand, findings in the hands and it, that led us to the feet. And here we have another clue. And then we're starting to put this together. So now we go and we listen to the patient's chest and we should anticipate what we might hear when we listen to the patient's chest, their, their heart. Again, we have a hypothesis, and now, again, the, the ears can't hear what the mind doesn't know. So we go to listen to the chest, and you should think about what finding you might expect to hear in the, in the chest. Before I play the finding from this patient, I'm going to play norm, a normal heart. Here's a normal S1, S2. Okay. And that's, that's not what we hear in our patient. This is what we hear in our patient. So we see, we're, we're listening, first of all, we're listening over the apex of the heart right here. We're using the diaphragm of the stethoscope. And here's S1, here's S2, and there is a murmur, what we, what's known as a holosystolic, it starts right with S1 and ends with S2, holosystolic murmur. You can see that diastole between S2 and S1 is relatively quiet. There's a murmur in systole and it's plateau shape or holosystolic. So those findings that we looked at in the hands known as Osler's nodes, tender nodules, the feet, Janeway lesions, and he has a heart murmur, holosystolic heart murmur. So what do we think the underlying diagnosis is here? Probably endocarditis. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So he has endocarditis and likely involving the mitral valve. That murmur is, you know, in the apex, holosystolic, that's mitral regurgitation. But the case doesn't end there. A few days, so we know this patient has mitral valve endocarditis. His exam evolves over a few days. In hospital day number three, his heart, cha his heart sounds change to this. Does anybody know what this sound is? That would probably this the squeaky sound of uh, a pericardial friction rub. Yeah, that's great. That's absolutely right on. I'll play it one more time. It's kind of a scratchy, creaking leather, some, you know, kind of walking in fresh snow. Maybe if you imagine a balloon and the balloon is wet and you take your hand and you rub your hand over a wet balloon, 
has that same kind of quality to it. I'll play it again. That's a three component friction rub. So nicely done. So now we know that his infection is now involving uh, the pericard involving the pericardium. Okay, he has he has acute pericarditis. A couple of days later, the patient becomes hypotensive, presyncopal. His rub, his friction rub has gone away. In fact, his heart sounds are in general more distant, and his neck looks like this. So you can see engorged external jugular veins. Okay, and he's sitting in the upright position. So he is, uh, he has elevated central venous pressure or jugular venous pressure. And what is the diagnosis here? So we have distant heart sounds, hypotension, elevated jugular venous pressure. What has happened? What's the new diagnosis? So we know that his infection is now involving his pericardium. And all of a sudden, there's something now that pericarditis has evolved a little bit. Now his heart sounds, his heart's difficult to hear. The friction rub is no longer there. His, his neck veins are distended, and he's hypotensive. We have a few people writing. Uh, heart tamponade is one. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. This is tamponade. So now he has fluid, probably pus, in his pericardial space, and that's compressing the heart and causing cardiac tamponade. And those clues, we were able to follow his physical examination from day one, and we saw his heart evolve. We heard his heart sounds evolve from his holosystolic murmur to a friction rub to now going away because once the fluid develops, it separates the layers of the pericardium, which are no longer rubbing together. So the rub goes away. And all that fluid around the heart makes the heart sound sounds much quieter. And it causes a distension in the neck veins. And he, he developed tamponade, which is a life-threatening condition. Here's patient number three, a young woman. Again, we're dealing with the hands. So uh, this is a tough one. So she she's young. She's coming in with joint pain. She actually had some pain and swelling involving the top of her left foot and uh, she went into her primary care doctor who said this is probably an overuse injury rest it ice it which she did it actually went away but then she developed pain in her left knee and same type of thing swelling pain in her knee it wasn't getting better so she comes in to an emergency room and they do uh, a knee arthrocentesis they sample the fluid from her knee it shows something like 12 or 13,000 white blood cells, no organisms, but they're worried about septic arthritis. They take her for a, a washout procedure of the knee. So they open up her knee and they, they basically wash, they clean it out thinking it's an infected knee. She doesn't get better from that. So they take her for a second washout procedure. She still doesn't get better. So she transfers to, to uh, our hospital and I'm meeting her and um, I, so she kind of has this migratory arthritis picture. And so I, I, I start looking at her fingernails and I'm looking for a certain finding. And that's, and I found this and I didn't know what this was. So if you all know what this is, then that's, that's really good. Um, I did, I did not know what this was, but I knew it wasn't normal. I was actually looking for something else in her fingernail. Does anybody happen to know what this finding is? And while you're, while you're thinking about that, I'll tell you that I did look it up and I, that I, I, I realized what this finding was. And so I started to do perform a better skin exam. And hiding behind her hairline on the back of her neck is this lesion here. And hiding behind her right ear is this lesion here. So does anybody know what these are? So that physical finding is known as an oil drop sign. 
And these these lesions, they're kind of scaly like lesions. Those are those are psoriatic plaques. And psoriasis, so psoriasis is a condition that can is associated with arthritis. It's known as psoriatic arthritis. And typically, the nail bed, the nail findings that I was looking for, um, nail bed pitting is what I was looking for. I didn't see that. I saw this oil drop sign. I didn't know what this was at the time. Now you know, and then I had to look it up. But um, uh, this is a this is a good, a very good clue at the at the bedside. And then I had to search for these physical for these lesions here, these psoriatic plaques, and uh, in order to find them. And this this patient went through two totally unnecessary surgical procedures. These physical findings were right there. And all that somebody needed to do was to perform a better physical examination. They would have found these clues and she would have been diagnosed earlier. Here's a young woman. We're sticking with the hands. Another, another uh, you know, really nice physical finding here. She's coming in with lightheadedness and she has um, the, uh, this is her, this is her hand here. And this is my hand here. What do you notice about her hand? Paying attention to the skin, the skin color. So this, her skin color is a lot more fair, a lot lighter. Yeah, so it's, so it's, it's fairer here and darker over the knuckles. And when I asked her, she said this, this is actually her normal skin color. So she has a uh, hyperpigmentation of her knuckle area. And this is another patient with the same condition. Now his has evolved. His hyperpigmentation is now generalized. This is his wife's hand here. And they said when this started about eight years ago, um, his skin tone was similar to hers. So now he's much, obviously much darker and he has generalized hyperpigmentation. He has the same condition. And by the way, this is sort of how it starts, is it starts over the areas of, of increased pressure, like the knuckles. And um, by the way, you can tell, the astute clinician can tell roughly when this patient started to feel sick, and you can tell by her fingernail polish. Notice that there's a gap at the base of her fingernail. And fingernails, they grow at about a millimeter a week. And there's probably two, two and a half millimeters of growth here between from the last time she painted her fingernails. So she got sick about two to three weeks ago and she stopped doing things like painting her fingernails. And that's exactly when she got sick. And uh, does anybody have any ideas as to what condition this might be? We have uh, Addison's disease. Yeah, exactly. This is adrenal insufficiency and specifically Addison's disease, uh, primary adrenal insufficiency. The reason why uh, primary adrenal insufficiency presents this way is that, um, so when I think about adrenal insufficiency, I think about is it ACTH dependent adrenal insufficiency or ACTH independent adrenal insufficiency? If it's dependent, ACTH dependent, that means that the ACTH level is low. So it's a central cause. Something in the hypothalamus or pituitary is not working and the ACTH levels are low. The adrenal glands are, are waiting for that signal to produce cortisol and mineralocorticoids, but it's, that signal is not coming. So that's ACTH dependent adrenal insufficiency. That's secondary or central. Uh, on the other hand, ACTH independent adrenal insufficiency is where the ACTH signal is coming from the brain, but the adrenal glands aren't responding to it. So what happens is the brain sends more and more ACTH, and that ACTH will stimulate the melanocortin-1 receptor in the skin and ca cause melanin production. And that's why patients with primary adrenal insufficiency develop hyperpigmentation. That ACTH levels go way up, the adrenal glands aren't working, and so that you know, no matter how high that ACTH level goes, the, the adrenal glands don't produce the right amount of cortisol. And uh, that was the diagnosis here in both of those cases. I'm going to skip this one just out of the interest of time. Um, let's go to this one. So this is a, a, a young man. We're back with the hands here. And uh, uh, he's coming in with blurry vision. And what do you notice about his hands?
Could this be a uh, arachnodactyly with long yeah, and skinny yes. fingers? Exactly, long and skinny fingers. And it's a little difficult to tell in this photo just how large and long his fingers are. But here's my hand, my hand's in the glove and I, I can palm a basketball for frame of reference. So I don't have small hands and his dwarf mine. And so this is arachnodactyly. So you develop a hypothesis in your mind. So of course that leads you to look inside the mouth and you're looking at the palate. And what do you notice here? This is a high arched palate known as an ogival, ogival arch. And uh, what is an OG? What is an ogival arch? It comes from Gothic era architecture where this was a, um, a common way or a, or a popular way to, to create an arch in the Gothic era where instead of um, we think of normally an arch kind of comes up and it's very smooth in the ceiling. But here, this is an ogival arch. It comes up and then it goes, rises again to a point. And that's what patient, patients with this condi condition develop. They develop this ogival arch, this high arched palate. And here's a, when I, I visited Syria in 2010 and I took a bunch of pictures. And when I was looking through the pictures, I noticed that I took a bunch of pictures of arches in, in Syria. And uh, here's an example of an ogival arch. This is actually from a famous castle. This is an archer slit. So this is where the archer would sit and wait for the enemy to approach. And you can see here that the arch comes up and then it go, it rises a little bit higher here to a point, And that's an ogival arch. This, it comes from this castle inside Syria, a very famous castle. And here, here's kind of the more typical arch in Syria. Here's a typical arch. Another one, these are Roman ruins from 2000 years ago in Damascus. And uh, it's, it's amazing to see these just inside the city. Um, and that's not the arch our patient has. He has an ogival arch, this high arch here. And so what's the diagnosis here? Marfan syndrome? Yeah, exactly. Now, again, we, it's very, it's, it's not as challenging when, you know, we're given these clues. We can put the, we can synthesize these clues. We can put them together and come up with a diagnosis. On a standardized test, you know, they will tell you the patient has a arachnodactyly or a high arch palate. But we want to be the types of clinicians the type of clinician that we're at the bedside and we're observing, we're making these observations. You know, these findings go missed all the time. And, and so we want to be the detective that doesn't gloss over these clues at the crime scene. And we know, you know, we can recognize arachnodactyly when we see it. We know that it's important to look at the mouth and we can recognize a high arch palate when we see it. That's the complete clinician, one who can not only synthesize information, but acquire those clues from the bedside. And um, so why does he have blurry vision? Well, patients with Marfan syndrome often develop lens dislocation in their eye, and that can you know, affect their vision. Here's a young man coming in with rapid weight gain. This is occurring over a period of six to eight months. Here's his driver's license photograph. And you can see he's a very different looking person now than he was just a year ago. And what what are the what do you notice about his about his face and and what's going on here? What what are the findings? A moon face. Yes, a moon face. What does that mean? He's developed adipose tissue all around his face and it's rounded his face. You can't see his ears in the straight on view. Look at his ears in the photograph here. We can see them easily. Look how square his jaw is. And he has just put on a lot of adipose tissue. And what else do you know? What do you notice about his forehead? He has acne. Okay, so he's developed acne there. And when you look at his back, you see this finding. This is known as the buffalo hump. And then these are abdominal striae or striae. And uh, the and then when you look at his skin, this is his his finger here. This is um, my colleague's finger. And what this is demonstrating is thinning of the skin. So when you look at the skin in a patient with this condition, it's very, very thin, cigarette paper thin. This is more normal. Okay, that's a normal skin fold there. This is not, this is very thin. So what's the diagnosis here? Again, not, not trying to fool you. Uh, 
Cushing syndrome. Yeah, exactly. This is Cushing syndrome. And this patient went many months without a diagnosis here. He was seeing his doctors and they were telling him, hey, you're just gaining weight, you need to diet and exercise. And he was told time and time again, diet and exercise. And he suffered for a long time, you know, um, w with this condition. And it wasn't diagnosed because people didn't take the time to make these, to, to, to you know, gather these clues from the, from the, uh, from the bedside. This next case is a young guy coming in with a painful knee. And you can see here in the photograph that the left knee is much more swollen than the right. You can barely see his patella here. You can see the outline there very well. And he reminds me of the patient with psoriatic arthritis. So he developed pain and swelling. One, one week it was his left shoulder, then it was his left knee, then his, then, his, then his right knee, then his right shoulder. And he was developing this migratory arthritis. And he actually had multiple MRI scans of his knees. And he had no trauma to the knees. And unsurprisingly, they were totally normal, the MRIs. Struct there was no structural damage in his knees. And um, I look in his mouth, and what do I see here? Well, there's this, this aptus ulcer right here, which ended up being an important uh, clue. And from the history, I learned that he had diarrhea before all of this started. He had a diarrheal illness. Does anybody have an idea what might be causing his migratory arthritis following a bout of diarrhea? There's actually a couple diagnoses that could fit here. I hope uh, Bichette's disease comes to mind. Great. It's a great thought. And um, I didn't tell you this, but but this is actually my cousin. He's a cousin of mine. And um, I also didn't tell you, I'm, uh, but I showed you pictures from Syria when I visited. So I'm Syrian. And so if you see a Syrian uh, or anybody from that region, the silk is known, that's known as a Silk Road disease from China through the Middle East, Turkey. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's a very prevalent Bichette syndrome uh, in that part of the world and that it's a great idea it wasn't the diagnosis here but that but this could definitely be uh bichette syndrome um the other kind of diagnoses that might be are something like inflammatory bowel disease so um there's something called um seronegative spondyloarthritis meaning that it, it's a it's an arthritis it kind of resembles rheumatoid arthritis but it's seronegative meaning that you know there is no the rheumatoid factor is negative, the anti-citrullinated uh, peptide is negative, um, and there are a couple diagnoses that, that could, a couple things that could cause seronegative spinal arthritis. Do you all know um, some of them? Psoriasis is one of them, and we already had a case of that. So psoriatic arthritis is one of the seronegative spinal arthropathies. think uh, reactive arthritis would maybe yes yeah. yes exactly and that's what the diagnosis was in this case inflammatory bowel disease could also cause it as well so this could have been ibd related in his case it was reactive arthritis to the gi illness that he had and in most cases it gets better within six months chronic cases last longer and they require anti-inflammatory medications and unfortunately his was became chronic um and here i am uh performing this this you know arthrocentesis here in his, in his living room. And um, uh, he, he's a lawyer, by the way, so I always joke that um, I, I was nervous uh, performing this medical procedure in, his, in a lawyer's living room while his wife was taking photographs of me doing it. But you can see that it worked out okay, because here I am, he's smiling, I'm smiling, and uh, so we got, the, we got the sample. And uh, it, was, it was approaching a long weekend, and his he was actually started on mesalamine, and he got better with misalamine, uh, but this was before it, it had kicked in. And, um, and so he needed a, a, an arthrocentesis for, uh, for comfort. This next case is one of my favorites. So it's a 62 year old man coming in with shortness of breath. And I'll also tell you that he's coming in with the clinical syndrome of heart failure. So he has weight gain, orthopnea, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea or PND, 
and his JVP is elevated, and here are his vital signs. And what do you notice about his vital signs? Is there any particular vital sign that stands out to you? We have a high systolic and a low diastolic pressure. Brilliant. So this is known as a wide pulse pressure. So the difference between the systolic pressure and the diastolic pressure is wide. It's large. And whenever I see that, I immediately think about something. And maybe you all do it as well. What condition do you normally associate with a wide pulse pressure? Aortic regurg. Exactly. So I thought even before I walked into the room, I thought, okay, this is going to be aortic insufficiency or aortic regurgitation. And um, again, anticipation is key in medicine. So what do I do? I go and I, I look at his hand, I look at his fingernails. And here's a movie of his fingernails. And um, do you all appreciate a finding there in his, in his fingernails? Both of them, actually. And again, it's a movie. This is not a static image. So what do you see? Well, it's one of those things where it might take you a little bit to see it, but once you see it, you see it. Do you, do you see that there's a pulsation in the nail beds? There's a pulse there. You can see it going from red to white to red, right there, right there, right there. Once you see it, you can appreciate it. It's known as Quinky's pulse. And again, it's a physical finding of aortic insufficiency or regurgitation. So now I'm thinking, oh, he definitely has aortic insufficiency. But what if I told you that when I went to listen to his heart, he did not have a diastolic murmur and his echocardiogram was totally normal. His aortic valve was pristine, no aortic regurgitation. His echo is normal. Well, it turns out that these physical findings here are not specific for aortic regurgitation. They are physical findings of a hyperkinetic or high output state and of any, from any cause. And anytime you have heart failure with high output physiology, you should think about a particular subtype of heart failure patients known as high output heart failure. It's, a, it's kind of a rare, uncommon thing. Most of the time we have patients with heart failure, their cardiac output is low, but in these patients, their cardiac output is actually high. And that's what gives you the wide pulse pressure and the, and the peripheral pulses like Quinky's pulse, high output. So when we, we did a right heart catheterization on this patient and his cardiac output was 13 liters per minute, which is nearly three times normal. So it kind of confirming the diagnosis of high output heart failure. But high output heart failure is one of those diagnos diagnoses in medicine where it's a diagnosis, but it's not really a diagnosis. It's kind of like anemia. Yeah, we can diagnose anemia, but we need to know what's causing the anemia. So the same is true for high output heart failure. So what are, do you all know the kind of the common or, you know, some of the causes of high output heart failure? We have uh, Takayasu. Okay, yeah, so, ta so Takayasu is a stress-induced cardiomyopathy. It still present, it typically still presents with reduced um, cardiac output. It's a great, great idea though, it's a great thought. Um, but some of the causes of high output heart failure, this is, um, you may not have learned about this. It's, it, it, some medical schools, they don't teach it because it's kind of a rare thing, but it's important. Things like thyrotoxicosis, things like liver disease, pregnancy, there's a, there's a vitamin deficiency that can do it. There's a wet and a dry form of this, of this vitamin deficiency. Do you all know what I'm referring to? It's a very, very disease, right? Yeah. Yes, exactly. So that's thiamine deficiency. And so what's the, what, what leads to thiamine deficiency? Um, what's a risk factor for it? At least in our in our countries, it's it's probably the most common cause. 
of thiamine deficiency. What what kind what type of patient develops thiamine deficiency? Drinkers, usually patients with alcohol, heavy alcohol consumption. So I went back and I asked him, and it turns out he's drinking four to five glasses of wine a day, putting him at risk for thiamine deficiency. And oh, here's a um, another physical finding of that high output physiology, this this very bounding carotid pulse. And uh, so we all made we made the diagnosis of wet berry berry here, and uh, his thiamine levels was you know were nearly undetectable. And so we made the diagnosis, and this is such a critical case to highlight because, you know, I would say most times this patient would have been given the diagnosis of heart failure. His echo was normal. And what do we call that when, when a patient has heart failure and their echocardiogram is totally normal? We call that heart failure with preserved systolic function. It's a very common diagnosis when we make all the time. And so he would have been given this diagnosis. We would have said, we're not sure why you have this, but you do here, take some diuretics, you'll feel better. And he probably would have been on diuretics the rest of his life. Finding the, the these physical exam findings of the wide pulse pressure, the quinkies pulse, the, bra the bounding carotid pulse, allowed us to realize the diagnosis of high output heart failure. From there, we were able to diagnose wet beriberi. And why is that so critical? Because it's totally treatable. In fact, it's curable. Look what happens to his blood pressure over time with alcohol when he, after he stops drinking alcohol and with thiamine replacement. Blue is the systolic blood pressure, orange diastolic, and green is the difference between them. And he was cured of his condition over time. So again, because of those physical findings, we were able to make this diagnosis. This next case is, uh, again, there's only a couple more cases. This one is no, we, uh, we, it's known as an Augenblick diagnosis. So. Uh, there in, in Austria, uh, Nicola may, may be familiar with that term. Blink of an eye um, in, in German. That's what it, that's what it uh, what it uh, re what it refers to. It means that you can make this diagnosis quickly, just like that. And here is the video. So you can walk into the room, you can look at this neck, and you can make the diagnosis like that. And this is a certain valvular condition. Anybody know the name of this finding or the condition? This, this wave in the neck. A lot of people think this is the carotid pulse. It's not the carotid pulse. This is the jugular venous pulse. And normally it doesn't look like that, but there's a valve lesion that's causing that finding. And here's a patient with the same condition, different patient, obviously. What do you notice about her head? Do you notice anything there? And you can see, I'm not zoomed in, but you can see she has the same finding in her neck. It's causing her head to bob side to side because you get this big, this is, this is, anybody know what this is? We have a, a, in the chat a frog sign. Uh, good thought. So frog sign is Canon A-Wave. It's not the frog sign, but it's a great thought. Um, this is, within the differential of the frog sign. So normally the jugular venous pulse, we see the inward movement. We don't see the outward movement so well. Uh, but when you see the outward movement, it's going to be a cannon A wave like you were thinking. Or it's going to be a giant A wave or it's going to be something known as CV fusion or Lanchese sign. And that's what this is. It's Lanchese sign, which is uh, severe tricuspid regurgitation. So every time that right ventricle squeezes, all this blood is going backwards into the neck. And every time it shoots up the neck, it causes her head, the patient's head, to bob side to side. So let's look at that again. So this is known as Lanchese sign or CV fusion. Every time the RV squeezes, all that blood, because of the tricuspid regurgitation, it's going backwards into the right atrium and into the neck. This is a man that um, I saw when I was working on the uh, procedure service in our hospital. So I was asked to do a procedure, a paracentesis on this patient with ascites and I walk into the room and I'm struck by these engorged veins in his temple area. In fact, when he, they were all over his cranium. And of course I couldn't help but notice this and here's the video associated with it. So he's sitting in the upright position. You look how engorged these veins are. Look at his EJ, his external jugular veins, totally engorged. You can see the inward movement of the venous pulse there. And um, so I turned to his wife and I asked her, you know, if she had noticed these things. 
And she said, yeah, she had. And she's asked multiple doctors, what are they? And she said, not only did they not give her an answer, but they seemed disinterested in her question. They sort of dismissed her question as if it wasn't an important question. And, and you know, we were we were interested in, in the question. And so we um, ultimately this patient underwent a right heart cath procedure and his right atrial pressure was very, very elevated, 31 millimeters of mercury or 42 centimeters of water. And he was walking around with elevated central venous pressure like this for a long time. And, you know, his clinicians weren't interested in it. And um, it was a critical finding here to make a diagnosis for this patient. Um, and, um, you know, it really seems like, it seems like everybody knows how to order a cardiac MRI. I don't know if cardiac MRI is happening there in uh, Croatia, but here it's, it's this, you know, this new thing and everybody's ordering that. They don't know how to do, you know, read simple neck veins anymore. So this is a patient, he ended up having heart failure. He was a cancer patient and developed heart failure from his chemotherapy. But it could have been, could have easily been uh, superior vena cava syndrome. It could have been constrictive per pericarditis. So it was very important to, to understand the, the, the cause here of, the, of this you know, elevated central venous pressure. Last couple of cases. So here's a young man with shortness of breath. And I walk into the room and this is what I see. I see these big arterial pulses in his neck. And um, to give you the background, he actually spent a week in the ICU with, he came in with cardiogenic shock. So he had heart failure. They took care of him in the ICU. They used diuretics and inotropic agents to make him feel better. He was discharged or not discharged, but he was transferred to the floor where I met him. And this is the day that I met him. So I see these, these big pulses and I'm thinking, okay, could he have aortic insufficiency as well? And so I look and of course, he also has that Quinky's pulse. So again, I'm thinking, oh, this is aortic insufficiency. So I go to his echo and he does have aortic insufficiency, but it's only mild. It would not explain these physical findings. So I thought, wow, could this be another case of high output heart failure? So I talked to the cardiologists. I tell them my idea. They say, well, don't worry. He's getting a cardiac MRI tomorrow and it will show high output heart failure if he has it. Well, the cardiac MRI didn't show high output heart failure, but it did reveal the diagnosis. And I was kicking myself, I should have been able to make this diagnosis. I didn't realize at the time that it was also on the differential for big pulses in the peripheries, uh, but it is. And in retrospect, after the diagnosis was made, I went and I felt his femoral artery and his radial artery, and there was, they were occurring at different times. So take a listen. I'm using Doppler here to illustrate the, the pulses. So you, you'll notice that they're happening at different times. Here are his radial arteries for comparison. They're happening at the same time. So there's a radial femoral pulse delay. Does anybody know what the diagnosis is here? He was actually born with this condition and he went 44 years without a diagnosis. All of his clinicians failed him, including me. And we stumbled upon the diagnosis with the cardiac MRI. Um, and uh, he has a, a condition that would, would result in the big pulses in certain areas of his body. Does anybody know what this is? Probably cortation. Yeah, nicely done. Exactly. Exactly. And now I've added it to my list of things because what happens is, the, is there's a blockage in the aorta. So all of the, the vessels proximal to that blockage get most of the cardiac output. So his carotid pulses are really big. His pulses in his fingers and his hands, his upper extremities are really big because all that cardiac output is concentrated in those areas. And um, so I've now added it to the list of physical findings of high output physiology. Aortic regurgitation, high output heart failure, coarctation of the aorta. And um, he had something like 12 or 13 chest x-rays. And you can see that he has a classic rib notching, but none of the x-rays showed the finding, which again goes to show you anticipation is critical in medicine. We can miss these things unless we're specifically looking for them. Um, I'm going to skip this one. 
So here's a woman coming in with shortness of breath and here are her hands. And you'll notice these small little red dots on her hands. So you look closely and you'll notice that they blanch and they fill from the inside out. Well, we've seen something like that earlier. These are telangiectasias, okay? And you start to formulate a hypothesis in your mind when you see telangiectasias and you ask her to form the universal sign of prayer, which she can't do. Her, her hands are so tight, she can't flatten out her hands. She, there's a space between them. There's also a nodule in her elbow, okay? And you look at her, at her uh, jugular venous pressure, her pulse. She's about to breathe in. You see it here, and she breathes in, and look at it climb all the way up the neck. You see that? So normally the jugular venous pressure goes down with inspiration. This goes up. So she's about to breathe in. There it goes. You see how it climbs up the neck? Anybody know what this is called? Could this be crest syndrome, scleroderma or something? Yeah, exactly. That's what she has. So, so the, the neck finding is called Kussmaul sign, and she has scleroderma. Exactly. When you listen, why, so why would she have dyspnea uh, if she has scleroderma? Well, these patients can develop pulmonary hypertension. So you listen to the heart, and you'll, you'll hear a loud, you'll hear a split S2, and the second part of that split is louder than the first. So she has a very loud pulmonary component of S2. So she has systemic sclerosis or scleroderma, as you all identified with pulmonary hypertension. Last case is a young woman coming in with transient weakness. She had five minutes of kind of right side of weakness, difficulty speaking. She goes to the emergency room. They document her physical exam as normal. And they say, we're not sure what caused this. They discharge her with follow up. Two days later, she presents with acute right sided flank pain. They, this time they say there's a subtle murmur on exam. They get a CAT scan because they're worried about appendicitis. The CAT scan doesn't show appendicitis, but it does show a right renal artery embolism. So you'll see the contrast in her left kidney. There's nothing in her right, so her renal artery is blocked. So she goes for an embolectomy procedure, which is successful, but during the procedure, she develops hemoptysis and hypoxemia. They do, they send off a million dollars worth of tests. They get a CTA for out of concern for PE. It doesn't show a PE, but it shows bilateral ground glass opacities. They do a bronchoscopy procedure and it shows diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. Eventually, after all of these tests, she gets an echocardiogram and it reveals the diagnosis, which was should have been made on day one. This is what her heart sounded like. So this is a tough one with a lot going on, but I'm gonna show you the annotated version. So the loudest sound in the clip is S1, and then systole is relatively quiet. You'll hear S2, and then you'll hear an extra sound after S2, which is an opening snap. You'll hear a long rumbling diastolic murmur that gets louder right before S1. So it's kind of like a, it goes like this. Does anybody know what this patient has? A loud S1, an opening snap, rumbling diastolic murmur. This would be the classic uh, findings of mitral stenosis. Exactly, exactly. And why did she present with a TIA? Well, these patients are very prone to forming blood clots inside the heart. Um, you've heard the term valvular AFib atrial fibrillation, valvular atrial fibrillation, they're not referring to any valve. It's not just aortic stenosis with, my, with, um, aortic, uh, with atrial fibrillation or mitral regurgitation with atrial fibrillation. It's specifically referring to mitral stenosis with AFib. Why? Because for whatever reason, that combination is very prone to forming clots and they can have strokes and different embolic events, just like the right renal artery embolism. So this patient had a finding if they had just listened with the stethoscope, they would have been able to make it 
you know, right away. And that first exam was documented as totally normal. So thank you for your time. I hope you guys enjoyed the talk. I hope you saw that the physical exam is a very powerful tool and it can help us make diagnoses um, early and treat patients and, you know, get, the, you know, without a diagnosis, it's very difficult to treat. So diagnosis is really critical in, in medicine. And uh, if you like what you saw in this talk, please visit our website. It's totally free, pdxpdx.com. And you'll see all of these, you'll see these cases, you'll see a, a lot more examples of everything that we saw and heard today. And um, uh, that's it. So thank you uh, so much for tuning in. And I'm happy to uh, chat more, answer questions, whatever you all want. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Matsur, for the superb uh, lecture. I'm sure this has been an enriching experience uh, for all of us here today. And it's always great to be reminded of the power that the physical exam still uh, holds to this day. So if anyone has a question for Dr. Mansoor, uh, you can write it in the chat. I will read it, read it out loud. And maybe while you guys are writing, uh, I would just like to say a few things. So I, I fully recommend uh, Dr. Mansoor's webpage, uh, Physical Diagnosis PDX. I really think it's a, it's a one of a kind website. I have not found anything like it. Uh, they use real patient footage real clinical cases, uh, real auscultation recall recordings and not those computer generated uh, sounds that you can find very often online, which, which actually sound nothing compared to the real heart or the real uh, lungs. It has been really a great way to practice uh, the physical exam, especially at times uh, like these when access to the bedside is unfortunately limited. Uh, Dr. Uh, Matsur also has a, has a book which I actually have. <laughs> so this is the, the, the frameworks uh, for telemedicine and it has been, it has really been a great uh, companion uh, through my clinical rotations and, uh, and if you are intrigued by the frameworks approach uh, to diagnosis, I would, I would definitely fully recommend, recommend uh, the book. <laughs> Thank you, Nicola. I appreciate that. No problem. So do we have any questions? Uh, maybe maybe I can ask a question. Sure. So, what um, what are some of the resources besides uh, your your website, your book? What what is something that you could recommend, or what is something that you use uh, for clinical reasoning or the art of the physical exam? Yeah. So the my, one of my favorite books is um, the author is is Sapira. Um, S-A-P-I-R-A, -A, and it's called uh, The Art and Science of Bedside Diagnosis, and it's a great book. It's a very complete book. He talks about the history, physical examination, um, you know, of, of every system. So it's a very complete book, um, and it's wonderful. I love that book. If you are more interested in the cardiac exam, um, something called Bedside Cardiac Diagnosis by Marriott. It's an older book. It was like from the early 90s. A very good book that the, the chapters are short. They're only a couple pages long, so it's easy to digest and read a chapter here and a chapter there, and it's a really fantastic book. So um, I, I like those two uh, resources um, quite a bit. Sapira, if you can get Sapira, I highly recommend it. It's kind of hard mm -hmm. to come by, especially the older edition. I think the newer edition you might you might be able to get more easily, but that's what I would recommend. What what would you say, um, in your opinion, how could one improve their physical examination skill in, in times like this when, when access to the bedside is, is not available all the time? So, yeah, it's, it's, it's tricky. You know, uh, I think you're referring to the to COVID and the pandemic yeah. and all kind of. Yeah, and it, it's kind of, um, you know, I think that especially in the beginning, we were very reticent to, to go to the bedside and to, you know, see patients and be close to them. But, you know, um, now I feel as if, um, you know, um, we are a little bit, the, the, the cases are down at least here um, in, you know, uh, in Portland, Oregon. Um, and so I feel a little bit more comfortable, be, you know, going back to the bedside and examining patients closely. Um, but um, I think that that's the most important thing is to be, is to practice. Um, you know, it, it's sort of like, 
imagine playing basketball or, or you're learning how to play basketball and you read a book about how to shoot a jump shot. Okay. You can read a book all day, you know, for a year about how to, how to shoot a basketball, uh, a jump shot. And, you know, if you've never done it before and you go out there and you try to do it based on what you read, you're not going to do it well, you, you know? And so you have to, it's a combination of both reading and learning through lectures and things, but you have to be at the bedside and you have to be able to practice, you know, you practice these, these things. So, um, going to the bedside, practicing, if there are, if you all have a faculty member or some mentor there, that's good at physical examination, you should ask them. You, if you see something in a patient, ask them, call them, say, Hey, I think I'm hearing aortic insufficiency in this patient. I'm hearing a diastolic murmur. Can you listen and tell me what you think? or use each other to try to, you know, have multiple people listen and, and try to see if you can hear the same thing. That's very helpful to do. And then if you do have an echocardiogram or a patient has a diagnosis of aortic insufficiency, that's a great opportunity for you to go to the bedside and now look for things like Quinky's pulse or Corrigan's pulse, the big pulse in the neck, listen for that diastolic murmur. So I'm, I'm not against technology by any means. And in fact, it can help us calibrate our physical exam. If we know that a patient has severe aortic insufficiency or mitral regurgitation, go to the bedside and listen and look for those specific findings. That can be really helpful to kind of um, hone your skills and, and, and develop your skills. And like I said, having a, a friend or a buddy who can come in and listen, or if they, if they have a, a patient with a good finding, have them call you, page you, say, come in, I've got an S3 gallop, you should come listen to it. And listening to that gallop, well, you know, you have to hear gallops or these, these heart sounds, you have to hear these things a lot of times before your brain starts to recognize them. But those would be the things that I would recommend. So, uh, thank you. I don't, we, we don't have a question in the chat. If I can ask one more question, uh, uh, sure. if, if there's nothing. So uh, how, how do you manage to stay so uh, motivated? I mean, you, you just gave a lecture from 11 p.m. till <laughs> last minute after a long day you said you also went to the gym like how, how do you do it how, do, how what's, what's <laughs> yeah <the key? laughs> that's so funny, funny you asked that nicole i love this i love the job i really do it's so it's so intriguing i, I mean it, we are detectives and you know of course of course and, and this is true of any field not just internal medicine any field you're gonna have you know, things that are that are boring or, you know, if I have patients coming in, okay, it's just cellulitis or UTI or pneumo, you know, it's not so exciting, you know, um, but every once in a while you get a great case, a, a case that really makes you, you know, um, seek out clues and put them together and make a diagnosis. And the, those clues really uh, invigorate me and excite me, uh, you know, when I see them and I can put it together to make a diagnosis, I, I, I get a lot of enjoyment out of that and fulfillment, fulfillment out of that. And I love when the physical finding kind of uh, plays a role. As you can see, I had, you know, 15 cases where, and there's many more, I just can't fit them all in an hour, where the physical exam was really critical and I love that. Um, and I love hearing heart murmurs and hearing gallops. And it's just, to me, it's just amazing, the physiology and, and you know, even outside of the heart, the rheumatologic diagnoses like dermatomyositis, seeing the heliotrope, uh, heliotrope rash or the Gautrin's papules, it really um, energizes me. But um, I, I love it. I, I think it's fun and exciting. And so, you know, for, for why, I don't, I don't know, but, I, but it does excite me a lot. So I, it's um, it's been a passion of mine, you know, and and so for me, physical exam and diagnosis, those are the two passions that I have in medicine, and they come together. They often go hand in hand, so it keeps me going. Of course, if I don't see a great case for a while and it's all the boring, you know, cellulitis, UTI, I'm not as excited. But you know, maybe once a week or once every couple of weeks, I see a great case, and it really it's like a shot in the arm and it, it excites me a lot and it keeps me motivated and keeps me going and plus interacting with you all you know medical students and residents it's so fun for me to you know pass on this this information and and get you all excited about medicine and being detectives and finding these clues at the bedside so that that always keeps me going so i'm, I'm happy to be up you know this hour with you guys and I hope you enjoyed it and you know that it makes me happy to be able to be here with you guys so um so that that's how i would i would say i keep i stay excited about the job 
Well, uh, great, thanks. Uh, I'll definitely keep that on my mind uh, for my residency and uh, try to stay motivated throughout it. So I think if there's no more uh, questions, I would just uh, once again like to thank Dr. Marsur for taking time out of his personal time to speak with us here. Uh, it's just been a pleasure to talk to you all and hopefully can spread out the word and maybe have some more physical diagnosis for Paris uh, in the future. Absolutely. And keep in touch. My email is, is on here. And uh, so if you all want to reach out, feel free to do that. Um, always happy to hear from you guys. Thank you again for having me. I really appreciate it. Nicola, I'm sure we'll talk again soon. Uh, okay. Thanks for the invitation. Anytime. Yeah. Have a great day. Good I'm night. Gonna go <laughs> I'm going to go Thank sleep. Good night. Bye bye. Bye.